Welcome uh, to the Oxford Internet Institute and TU Munich Campus Heilbronn webinar series. Today, in our third session, we will provide you with new insights from science. Uh, we have used the title From the Classroom to the Workplace, AI Technologies and the Changing Face of Education to make you aware and give an insight in what science can say about how education, how educational technologies, how educational work, but how overall work is actually changing using the influence of AI. While generative AI is in everybody's mouth and thinking, it's not the only technology that can be used in that case. And we'll hope to provide you with an interesting insight um, where we give you three 15-minute sessions where the researchers will demonstrate the opportunities offered by the use of artificial intelligence. I would like you to make aware, I would like to make you aware that the session as always will be recorded um, and, and thus we will be able to review uh, what we have seen. We have three speakers today, three esteemed speakers. Dr. Lulu Shi from Oxford University uh, will make you start. She is a sociologist and lecturer at the Faculty of Education at Oxford. And her current research is the future uh, of education. Well, she'll point out how teaching, communication channels, and classroom curriculum are progressively really shaped by the technology. In the second step, Professor Stefan Krusche, an expert in software engineering at TUM Campus Heilbronn, will demonstrate his pioneering use of language models in the academic world in order to example, and the example of IRIS, a tool that uh, they developed, helps students to get a better understanding in a classical format that you might all know, being tutored by a tutor, by somebody else who can help you go along. And finally, uh, Dr. Fabian Stefani, who's also at the Oxford Institute of the Internet, built the bridge from these two teaching work examples to the world of work work, so to speak. He has asked what new approaches employers are taking when recruiting new talent and what skills the employment of tomorrow will actually need. With that brief overview, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Lulu Shi, who will quickly introduce herself again and then present her fascinating work to us. Lulu, your turn. Great. Right, thank you so much, Helmut. And also thank everyone um, for coming and joining this webinar. As Helmut has pointed out, I am a lecturer at the education department in Oxford. And my focus on um in my research focus is on education technology. Um, so I'm gonna try to sit, share a slide and go directly into my presentation. All right. Do you still uh, do you see my slides? Yes. Super. Okay. So um, my research, as I said, focuses on education technology or ed tech, as short. Um, and today I will talk about two uh, research questions that I'm asking in my work. And one is on the usage and the other one is on perception and which is also very much reflected in the title, education, technology, trends, usage and perception. Before I go into the work, I just want to quickly define what I mean with ed tech. Um, in this work, I define ed tech quite broadly and I focus on digital technology that is specifically designed for education. So that can be products that we use to gain skills, but also, for example, it can be virtual learning environments um, such as Google Classroom. But what I do not look at in this uh, research is technologies that is used for uh, for education, but not specifically defined um, or designed um, for education. So, for example, YouTube or other social media that is used in education. Um, but not designed for such in the first place. So this is what I'm not looking at. Now to the background, why is it important to look at education technology? Well, there is a hype around education technology and this has started... Connection was lost at that moment. So the proposal would be to go to Stefan Krusche now. And I think that is the wise proposal. Um, so we will check that Lulu comes back again, but it also says uh, something about the need of reliability and the question of internet availability to use such technologies. 
With that, I briefly hand it over to Stefan Grusha. I'm glad that we had all speakers here uh, from the beginning. So Stefan, you have been introduced already. Um, and I'll let me hand it over to you. And we will just reverse the sequence um, a bit. And we just do hope that uh, she can uh, come back soon again. Um, Stefan, please. Yeah, thank you, Helmut, for the nice introduction. And um, I hope my internet is more reliable. My name is Stefan Kusche. I'm a professor for software engineering at the Technical University of Munich at the campus Heilbronn. And I'm very much also researching in the area of education technologies. And this is also what I would like to present uh, to you today. We developed a chatbot called Iris that we use in order to improve the communication with students, but that we also use for a couple of other use cases. So my title is called Iris Pioneering AI Assisted Educational. And the main motivation behind this is that we have a couple of scenarios in the university where we currently struggle, in particular at the Technical University of Munich, where we have not hundreds of students, but thousands of students in our introductory lecture courses. One of them is quite obvious. Um, it's the students who need um, assistance, especially in the first year when they come to the university and when they receive exercises that are hard for them and that they cannot master on their own. In addition, when it comes to the creation of exercises, Gen AI and large language models um, such as ChatGPT could also be out um, for help. And um, a third use case could be that when those many, many students participate in those exercises and submit their solutions, we could use artificial intelligence, generative AI, in order to automatically provide feedback to them quite quickly so they don't have to wait and see whether their um, solution is correct or not. They can do that immediately. And last but not least, when it comes to the learning support, um, to the activities that the students do, we see that the students get more and more heterogeneous. And this is why support um, regarding lecture content, but also learning support in general about the um, learning analytics that the systems can provide might be of help. And I would like to go in a couple of those areas in the next minutes and show you how we have implemented systems to support these use cases. And um, before we do that, I'd like you to understand that we have developed our own learning platform called Artemis. It's open source and it can be used by um, different universities, um, uh, many different instructors and students. And the main idea is that it allows us to implement interactive learning, a learning approach that we have designed, where you quickly um, yeah, mix up theory and exercises. And when students then participate in those exercises, they can submit their solution to Artemis, and Artemis will automatically provide feedback. When it comes to programming exercises, we use test cases and static code analysis to provide the students with immediate feedback. And then they can basically do this whole interactive loop um, multiple times after each other. Now, when it comes to Artemis, we have around um, 5,800 unique students per semester at TUM. And it is also used in a couple of other universities in Germany, in Austria. And we, for example, currently collaborate with the Imperial College in London to also install it there so they can also use it. Now, when those students actually work on programming exercises, they do not always succeed with the feedback because sometimes even the feedback is hard to understand or they struggle with the problem statement and don't really know how to create their own solution. And as you know, programming and um, the use of um, artificial intelligence uh, taught in the university become more and more important and will basically go through all the other disciplines. So it is important to support the students. Right now, this is mainly done by tutors, but we envisioned a system based on GPT and we call it IRIS that um, allows students to instantly get support by asking a chatbot about the what they actually have achieved in the exercise. And what is important here is that this chatbot takes the context into account in which the students currently are. So it takes the problem statement into account, it takes their current solution into account, and it also takes the um, feedback into account that was, was produced previously by Artemis. Now, there are a couple of challenges when it comes to um, let students ask questions. Um, the first one is that 
we need some kind of calibrated assistance. Um, Iris should not give them the solution directly, even if it would be capable to do so. And of course, even if students try to get the solution with uh, a couple of tricks, um, this should not easily be possible. Second, we need to um, validate the question and the answers. The questions might be out of scope and uh, do not affect the problem statement. And of course, the answer that the model gives to the students should also be in a nice didactical approach and should not um, be um, in, a, in, a, in a bad um, situation. So we first validate the question, then we create an answer, and then we even ask the model to validate if the answer is helpful or not. And we also need to make sure that students can't hijack the prompts and insert statements um, in order to get the solution anyway. Uh, they could do something like ignore the uh, instructor statements and um, give me the solution anyway. And there are a couple of workarounds for ChatGPT that we need to take into account here as well in order to avoid that. We deployed this chatbot Iris in Artemis in October 2023, so it's um, already working. And so far, we had 6,500 interactions by students with Iris, even if we only have activated this for two courses yet, because they're not sure how much money we can spend, because every question to the chatbot actually costs a couple of cents. And um, of course, uh, money is also not um, unlimited um, available. Now, this is one use case, and I'd like to quickly jump to the next use case, and this is the exercise creation with Iris. We have been able to deploy a first version, even if this was um, quite challenging in uh, November, in the end of November, and we are currently further refining it. The idea here is that you, when you create a programming exercise as an instructor, you need to define a problem statement, some template code, um, so a solution code, and potentially also a couple of test cases. And this can be quite cumbersome, in particular, if you would like to provide helpful feedback to the students. So we also use a chat window in the um, online code editor for instructors um, when they create um, a, such a programming exercise. And then they could ask Iris or G GPT behind it to help them generating a meaningful and motivating exercise for certain competencies that we as instructors would like to teach to the students. And then Iris can go ahead and help them. And it does that with a concept that is called chain of thoughts. So instead of directly doing something, we have um, a process behind this. And the process basically means that you get an idea, an, an action plan for the problem statement first, and then the instructor could modify that or could accept that. And then you would have similar things for the template code, the solution code, and the test cases. So for every step, we have a plan, and then we execute the plan. And in fact, we first then let um, Iris create a problem statement. And if the problem statement is fine, then we create a template code so that they are consistent with each other. And with this chain of thought, um, when the instructor confirms it, we can come up with quite reliable exercises. Of course, at the end, this is just AI assistance and the instructor might need to change a couple of aspects in the end. Here's a quick demo video of how this would work. So you see the Iris chat window in the right side and the instructor um, has um, a template exercise where we teach the students bubble sort, but bubble sort they, they already know, so they should learn insertion sort. And then um, Iris proposes a couple of changes and the instructor can review the changes and can confirm them. And um, in the end, um, let the model actually generate the or execute the action plan. And then the model would generate the changes for the problem statement, the changes for the template code, for the solution code, and for the test repository. And of course, this um, can take quite a while. So in this video, we made this a, a little bit shorter. And um, after you close the chat window, you will see the new problem statement on the right side. You see that we have a markdown syntax here to support an interactive task and UML state. And uh, instead of having bubble sort, you now have insertion sort in all the places. With that, we can not only create new exercises, but also create exercise variants based on different topics. So you might have a variant with airplanes to learn for loops, um, but you also might have a variant for cars to learn for loops. And this is interesting because not every student has uh, the same interests. So we can target this um, based on the personal profile of the student. 
And in examinations, we can use multiple variants to avoid that students collaborate with each other. In fact, we could also use it to create programming exercises for different programming languages. So if you already have a Java exercise, you could um, create a variant in Python, for example. And what is also interesting, we can adapt the difficulty. So if we have a medium difficult exercise, but we have a couple of students without a lot of experience, we could create a more easy one for them for the learning process. Or if we already have experienced students and they are kind of bored with the medium-sized exercise, we cr could create a more difficult exercise for them. And our vision in the future is that instead of having one exercise for 2,000 students in a course, we might have one exercise per student based on the interests, competencies, and the personal profile of the student. Um, and we hope that this will be possible in a couple of years using generative AI. The next use case that I would um, like to quickly show you and um, with a mock-up that we envision is learning analytics. Um, in Artemis, we already have a couple of statistics. You can, for example, see your score in the current course. You can see the current competency that you're working on. Um, you can view a learning path and you can also compare your exercise performance to the average or the best students in class. Now, this on the other hand is relatively static and some people might not really look at it or might not really understand what's going on. And therefore we also envision a system in which Gen AI, first of all, greets you with a motivating message based on your existing performance. So this is targeted to the specific learner profile suggests you the next exercise, but also allows you to ask questions about your performance or about how well you are doing the course and the exercises actually. Um, this is still work in progress and we are not yet there. So we hope to finish this until the beginning of next year. And the last use case that I would like you um, to understand is that so far I showed you um, Iris in the context of exercises and learning analytics. Now, we also would like the students to ask clarification questions on lectures. Right now, we offer them a chat system such as Slack or Discord, and our tutors in uh, such big courses try to answer the questions to the students. But of course, if tutors are involved, they might make mistakes because they do not fully understand the concept, or they might also take some time and the student questions are not answered within a short amount of time. So it would be nice if Iris and GPT behind it could also ask questions on lecture content. Now, the issue with lecture content is that you do not only have one slide, but you have a lot of slides, right? In our courses, it's easy that we have 500 to 1,000 slides for just one semester that the students need to learn with. And all those slides, they do not really fit into the token context window of GPT-4, even in the latest version. And GPT-4 is quite expensive. So if you go to GPT-3.5, it even does not fit at all into the context window. So the challenge here is to actually find the right context and to provide enough context that Iris can answer the question in a meaningful way without polluting the context with irrelevant information. And this can be achieved by using tokenization and embeddings. So for each slide, we can basically create a um, matrix or, or a vector representation. Um, based on text embeddings, and then uh, store them in a vector database, such as, for example, Chroma. And if the student is now asking a question, we could do the same technique and create a vector for the student questioner, and then compare the student question vector with the existing vectors in our database. So we go through all the slides and find the relevant slides that are closest to the question of the students by, for example, using a cosinus distance but it would also be possible to use other mechanisms. We are still researching what the best approach would be. And then we might find the relevant slides and then we can put them into the context. This can be one slide, but this could also be multiple slides. And then hopefully in the context, in the prompt of the question to GPT, we can provide enough information so that GPT can answer the question of the student in a meaningful way. Great. So coming to a short summary of what I've shown you today in this um, around 15 minutes, we have a couple of use cases in mind for AI-assisted education. We already have student assistance in place for, on the exercise level. 
We can support instructors to create new exercises. And we are currently working on automatic feedback also for text-based and modeling exercises. We have a more creative context. context. And we are already quite far ahead of that and hope that we can still publish and deploy a version in December where students then can um, get detailed feedback on text exercises and modeling exercises as well. And we are working on um, lecture content support with the tokenization and on learning analytics support. And um, right now we plan to deploy a first version in February um, next year. That's it from my side. Thank you. And I hope I could um, show you the fascinating world of AI assisted education and what we plan with it in the next couple of months. I'm open to question and I think um, the question will be at the end after the other presentation. So thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for a really highlighting a presentation. Fascinating to see how the world of AI tools enters into the educational processes, but also fascinating to see at which speed some of these changes and possibilities can be developed. And it's also great that with great speed, Dr. Lulushui came back on the internet, so we can uh, continue where you left us very unfortunately. Um, and I think it's an uh, back, interesting backdrop uh, to come back to the look at various educational technologies, plural, number of them, uh, in your research. And while we have seen at what speed and at what with what impetus and purpose technologies um, for tutoring are actually being developed. So Lulu, the floor is yours second time and we'll just um, hope that it works this time. Yeah, thank you so much. And my apologies. Um, always when I talk about ed tech um, in a critical way, uh, something happens with my technology, <laughs> not wanting to throw any conspiracy theory out there. But um, let me share my slides for the second time. I'm not going to start from the beginning. I hope that you can remember what I was talking about. So yes. I'll go straight into the backgrounds again. Um, so the background, um, there is this hype around education technologies, also very much in the public discourse. So that kind of um, begs a question um, that, or we need to systematically understand what is actually the discourse around education technology to understand who are the main drivers behind shaping this discourse and also what are their interests. And then we also need to understand what kind of technologies is actually being used and whether that there's a discrepancy between the um, discourse and the actual usage. So this is a background. And with that in mind, um, I want to talk about these two research questions for, for today. So the first one is asking uh, or try to understand what is the uh, public discourse around it. And this is the work with uh, Professor Rebecca Einan, who's also at the OII and partly at the education department. And what we did is we did a uh, discourse analysis of uh, media, that is uh, British media, that cover EdTech. Um, and... Um, understanding media is important because media does shape the opinions and beliefs of the public and also of policy actors, of investors, which then often has very real consequences um, in terms of what kind of products will be funded into existence and also what is accepted by the users and also how they are regulated. And the methodology for this is, um, as I said, we did a analysis of newspapers um, in the UK. And the second research question is around the usage. That is how much edtech is being used and how has that developed in the recent time with its hypes around um, education technology. And this is work uh, with Dr. Fabian Stefani, who is also on the talk. Um, so if there's any question about methodologies and the project, we're happy to um, get your questions in the end together. And to answer this question, we scrape data from online to build this um, index. Now, to the first question, what is the ethic discourse in the British media? Now, we analyzed 171 newspapers that were published around um, or between early 2019 and July 2021, which covers the uh, pandemic that happened in between. And this figure shows a summary of the qualitative text analysis, and this is 
kind of a summary or a quantification of the qualitative text analysis, because I think that provides a good overview of the topics that we have identified in this discourse analysis. And these are the topics listed on the right hand side, and you can see that the frequency or the coverage of those different topics are very different. So one of the major theme was around inequality or social inequality. So for today, also, I will talk about only um, social inequality and the second theme that we also found uh, that is data ethics and privacy. As to social inequality, we did find that there is actually ample of critical voices reflecting on the issues in digital um, education technologies. But these critiques, they rarely actually address the broader social, economic and political structures that is underlying the surface inequalities. So um, in that, this narrative then can hide the aspects that uh, unequal distribution of technology is itself based on, um, that is the deep rooted mechanisms um, with, and embedded in the social structure, which actually have led to this digital inequalities in the first place. And uh, one could argue that this diverts the public attention away from discussing the actual causes of social inequalities by layering, layering the surface of um, technological solutions on top of that. And um, we also argue that this discourse can actually facilitate and disguise the power structure um, by not actually uh, targeting these as such. And as to the second topic, data ethics and privacy, um, here we found that there is a lack of discussion around edtech firms' responsibilities. So these articles that we have looked into, they portray edtech companies as trusted actors who are in the role of protecting sensitive data from data breach. And the discussion around the responsibility of edtech firms is very much limited to the context of their role as a protector of the student's data from illegitimate actors. So in other words, there's very little concerns about um, tech firms' rights to collect data, to own the data, and also to analyze the data. And there's also a lack of scrutiny regarding what these themes are doing or are intend to do with the data. So our analysis show that edtech firms, they really kind of have escaped the public scrutiny and the discourse legitimizes them as the authoritative actor group by leaving them or ascribing them the role as uh, the data protectors. Um, and what we also did in this analysis is to look at who are actually the dominating voices in the media. That is, who um, is, for example, giving direct quotes, who is being interviewed, and so on. And what we found is that edtech businesses are the dominating voices. And that is really useful to explain or to understand why the discourse is so much in favor of um, edtech companies. Um, as this uh, very simple pie chart shows that um, edtech businesses, they are are covered the most as this dominating voice in direct quotes and so on, and even more than schools, teachers, and parents, which arguably should be at the center of education, since we are talking about education. So this is a very quick summary of this one uh, project that I've been working on. Um, and let's move uh, to the second one, where we ask a question, how much education technology is used, and also how, how has that developed in the recent time? To answer this research question, we, um, so Fabian and I, we scraped data from app stores. Um, so the challenge here was that uh, edtech usage, that is data around edtech usage, is proprietary data. And it's really hard, if not impossible, to get hold of that data. So instead, we decided to scrape data from um, app stores. And why app stores? Because um, many, if not most, of edtech products, they can be accessed via apps. So understanding um, app usage can give us a good understanding as such, as that is how much edtech as such is being used. And what we did in this first round is we scraped um, information on uh, education-related apps and we scraped data on the reviews, that is a frequency and uh, of reviews. And we are um, improving this index, which I'm not showing today yet, um, but now we're also gonna take account of um, the download statistics. 
Um, but what I'm showing you today uh, in this figure, this is still based on the review stats. Um, and with this, we proxy um, the usage of EdTech. And what you can see here is data scraped from 2000, early 2019 until end 2021. And what you can see with this curve is that there's a sharp increase early 2020, um, 2020. And this is exactly when the school closures happened during the pandemic, where all the children were sent home and had to access education via technology. So this peak in um, during the pandemic is very much reflected in uh, this index that we're currently building. But what you can also see is that the curve drops after when the schools reopened again to a really similar level to the pre-pandemic phase. Um, so this figure kind of um, is very much counter the public narrative around EdTech is here to stay and also that EdTech is the future. But then um, this figure shows the aggregated data that we collected from App Store. So it's really the pool data of all apps um, together. So then we um, kind of ask ourselves whether this is actually accurate picture and whether or not we need to differentiate between different types of apps because um, there are so many different apps doing different things, delivering different services and functions. And it is very possible that um, the function, the uh, usage is actually very different um, across different types of apps. So in order to check our hypothesis, whether it does differ, uh, what we did in the next step is to, uh, we looked into the websites of these um, edtech products uh, to identify what are the main functions that they deliver. So we did a text analysis of those websites um, and we've identified the main um, kind of functions and services they deliver. Now, what this heat map shows um, on the horizontal axis are 17 different functions that we identified in the first round. Um, we are revising that, but I think this should just give you an idea about the range of different uh, functions or services these EdTech apps they provide. So it ranges from, uh, for example, automating different uh, aspects in learning and teaching to uh, measuring and also tracking behaviors of students and teachers. And um, what this heat map shows is that the popularity does indeed, indeed differ uh, depending on what kind of functions they provide. So the way how to read it is the first row um, are apps that have increased in the usage and the second one is apps that have decreased in usage. So if we, for example, look at the increase, we can see that apps which tend to have a strong focus on measurements, that is this dark blue uh, box, which is indicating high loading in certain functions, um, these apps tend to increase in their usage. And in contrast to that, apps which tend to have a strong focus on delivering or facilitating collaborations and connectivity, they tend to decrease in their usage. So this just gives you a picture of how it differs across um, different apps. And also, it really um, also makes us think about where is education going? That is, if we increasingly tend to measure things, standardize things and benchmark things in the classroom, but then have a lesser emphasis on this collaborating aspect um, in the classroom, wh what does that mean in terms of uh, education? Where is education going into the future? Um, I'm not going to discuss these uh, kind of bigger questions here, but we are discussing that in the paper. And just to wrap up, um, the I in in my current work, um, there are two main questions. First of all, is the discourse around EdTech, and the second one is on the actual usage. And uh, what I presented today are some findings that, um, first of all, uh, EdTech companies, they are the main actor that is shaping the discourse, which we do need to um, bear in mind as these actors have specific interests and agenda um, in their mind when shaping the discourse. And the second finding is that um, there was a peak during the pandemic in terms of edtech usage. Um, and there's also need to differentiate between different types of apps if we want to understand the usage trend.
With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, well, we'll give uh, the word over to Helmut. Thanks, Lulu, for a fascinating insight uh, into how the world of media looks at uh, the technology and what uh, discrepancies can be seen with what's actually talked about and what's actually used and uh, where the whole area of educational technologies, plural intended, uh, it might develop. Um, and I think it is very interesting to contrast that uh, to a certain extent to Stefan's contribution where it's driven by a purpose and another way of uh, providing an individual service. And I think that's very important to observe in the area of educational work and educational technology to support educational work, how different viewpoints um, can be seen. So if you combine these two layers or levels of analysis, a very interesting picture uh, evolves uh, on how it's actually perceived by the various stakeholders in the educational system. Um, and I think that was a highlighting an opening or opening set. Let's go to Fabian Stefani, already mentioned as um, the answer to all methodological questions. But uh, Fabian is uh, well known for uh, the work on skills and skill demand and skill importance changes. And I'm looking forward to carry it on from the world of educational work and support for educational work to the world of general work and AI based work. So Fabian, it's all yours. Thank you, Helmut, for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks a lot for uh, Lucy, Ellen, and the entire team from the OII and Tom uh, for, for organizing this wonderful webinar series. I'm, uh, I'm very delighted to um, conclude this um, lineup of fabulous presentations with um, a talk on skills and labor markets. But before that, I would like to ask Lulu to stop sharing her screen um, because then I can I can share mine. The collaboration part. Yes, sorry. So that was a problem <laughs> that I mentioned to Lucy. I lost control of my Zoom again. So if Lucy can, great. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here we go. Just a second, and then I'll be on my presentation. The power of symmetry. Okay, which you should be searing on full screen right now. So um, we heard a lot about education and um, fabulous technologies that are entering uh, the world of, of education. Some of them require closer inspection and potentially also regulation, as Lula pointed out. But in general, education has, among um, many empowering facets, the target of teaching us relevant skills, of teaching us the skills that we need to prepare ourselves for um, an independent life and for um, facing the various disruption and changes, societal, technological um, changes that lie in front of us. And um, as you can all imagine, there are loads of changes, there are loads of disruptions that our society, that our labor market is currently um, facing. And we wanted to see how these um, changes impact the importance of skills. That's the, the topic um, a general topic of the skill scale project that I'm heading at the Oxford Internet Institute and the project or paper, which is currently under review that I'd love to share with you here has been a collaboration with one of my colleagues, Eugenia um, Gonzalez Erlinger, uh, to whom I um, well, are greatly indebted for her for wonderful work on this um, on this project. Let's talk about these challenges a little bit more before we, we dive into this. One of the challenges, one of the big changes that we're facing in our society, particularly on the labor market right now, I think we're all aware of this. Um, as Helmut already mentioned, it's in everybody's mouth, it's on everybody's mind. It's a shift to an increasingly digital labor market. It's the impact of digital technologies, most predominantly these days, of um, technologies like generative artificial intelligence, like large language models, DALI or ChatGPT, for example. The other big change that we're facing right now is not so much introduced or induced by technology, but more by policy. And that is that um, countries around the world, I mean, we've just uh, witnessed the COP um, conference, 28 conference, countries around the world have realized that they have to do something against the most pressing changes that we're facing due to the climate crisis and accordingly decided to adapt industries, adapt technologies to become more environmental friendly and to become more energy efficient. But what I'd like to underline here in general in our research project and for this talk in particular is that 
We cannot regard technology isolated of workers and isolated of skills. Technology requires workers with great skills. Without skills, technology cannot be developed, cannot be applied, cannot be maintained, cannot be developed further, and can also not be regulated. So technology is always, throughout history, has always been intertwined with skills. And so if we see new technology coming into the labor market, be it technologies like artificial intelligence or be technology around saving um, energy, these introductions of new technology always require some sort of changes in the skill set of workers, reskilling, upskilling, learning new skills. But this development is happening very, very swiftly. I mean, um, many of us, even experts, were surprised by how quickly, for example, a technology like generative artificial intelligence started to penetrate all sorts of sectors, all sorts of industries just throughout the uh, last 12 month. And the big question is, how does the labor market react to, to such a uh, shock? So the conventional approach would be to adjust education. We heard all about education today. But as we see increasingly in the literature, this conventional response to technological and societal changes might be a bit too slow, actually. For those of you who are working in, in teaching in academia in the university sector, uh, you know how long it could take to line up to roll out an entire degree in something like machine learning, artificial intelligence, or, um, or data science. I know there are a couple of social data science students uh, joining here from the OII, so you're uh, some of the front runners in this development, actually. And so in this difficult situation where technological change might be outpacing conventional educational approaches, theory suggests that employers might be shifting to a new practice to find talent because they can't find talent via the level of formal education. So they're looking for skills in specific. And so they apply something called skill-based hiring. Very, very briefly put, skill-based hiring puts more emphasis on skills than it does on education when it comes to the hiring practices of employers. And we want to closely examine whether this is the case due to this twin transition as this you know, joint transformation between digital and green technologies is often called on the UK labor market. What we did is we analyzed a large and relatively large data set of roughly 1 million online job vacancies from the year 2019 to 2022 from the UK labor market. So these are job postings that everybody should be familiar with. All sorts of sectors and industries are covered over these last four years uh, where companies uh, from all around the UK, all regions have been advertising various jobs. And what we did is we grouped these jobs, these advertisements into three groups, AI, green and other. So whenever an advertisement contained the requirement of a specific AI skill, and I'll talk about what these skills mean a bit um, later on in the presentation, we coded this advertisement as an AI advertisement. Similarly for green jobs, for green skills, whenever it contained a skill that is related to green technologies, it's classified as green and everything else is in the category other, is the rest of the labor market. And what we see in this chart here, for example, is that indeed, the demand for AI in green roles is growing very, very strongly over the last year. And it's growing much more strongly for AI, for example, than compared to the average market, which is characterized by the other category. And again, in this scenario, we've been wondering, OK, probably the talent pool might be getting really, really thin in uh, these specific new domains. And so we're facing an excess demand. Demand is much higher than supply. And we postulate that employers might be shifting to the practice that we call skill-based hiring. We wanted to investigate this with um, three working hypotheses. And we identified that skill-based hiring could be best characterized by three things. We would assume that these postings will be talking less about formal education requirements in AI and green roles. They'll be talking more about individual skills, so putting skills at the center. And on top of this, as we have wage information on these, on many of these job vacancies as well, we assume that there's a premium in offering wages on skills. So specific skills have become particularly valuable. And the important thing is this is in addition to the value of formal education in these roles. So let's have a closer look at what these requirements, education skill requirements of these jobs actually are. What we see here on the left-hand side is a comparison of how education intensive these postings are. Again, we have our three categories, AI, green, and other. 
And what we see is that some of these roles are very education intensive. So in 2019, to give you some of guidance how to read this chart, in 2019, so the very left bar here in this chart shows you that almost 40% of all vacancies required at least a bachelor's, if not a master's or a PhD degree. This education intensity is lower for green jobs, but still much higher um, than the level of 10% of higher education requirements for all the other jobs. But what we also see on the left-hand side is that there is a slight change happening when we look at AI roles. So the formal education requirement has dropped from 40% to roughly 30% four years later in 2022. And this is already one of the indications that formal education might be losing ground in terms of importance when we look at these newly emerging and strongly demanded domains. What we see on the right hand side, on the other hand, is the skill intensity. And this is how often or how frequently these postings talk about specific skills. And what we see here is a very strong difference among these three groups. We see that green postings speak a lot more about skills than the average labor market advertisement, but we see that AI postings even more so do. So the average mentioning of skills in the same text length is roughly speaking five times higher for AI roles than it is for any other posting on the labor market. And these are already strong descriptive indications that formal education is less in the focus of these new job categories than skills actually are. We also had a closer look at wages, of course, and what we see here, roughly speaking, again, comparing on the left-hand side, formal education to um, the different categories, the different skill categories, we see that AI roles, and I'll try to focus a bit more on AI, given the theme of this talk, that AI roles, on average, pay much more than the average job advertisement, offering much higher salaries, but even higher than the highest formal, high formal education job position. So vacancies that advertise a position where a master's or a PhD degree, for example, is required. You can also have a closer look at the different skill categories that we managed to squeeze out, to sift out from the content of these advertisements. Here, um, I'll spare you the details on the green skills on the right-hand side in the interest of time, but focus a bit more on the left-hand side where we look at specific AI skills. We identified various um, skill categories and skill themes, and again, had a look at the average asking wages, the offered wages of these positions. And you remember that the... Um, average on this labor market for all the other positions is roughly speaking a median salary around 30,000 British pounds per year. And we see that many of the AI categories, so many of the postings that require specific AI skills are way above this um, market average. And interestingly, it is not only that AI skills in a very specific and very you know high-end domain of developing artificial intelligence like natural language processing are so rewarding. We also see, and that's the second bar here, that um, there's a strong reward on working with expert systems. And expert systems in our categorization here, briefly speaking, are systems like IBM Watson or, for example, Chat GPT. So what we see is that there's also an additional um, monetary reward on the application of AI technologies in contrast to the development of AI technologies. We also see this across industries. Interestingly, just to give you one highlight, it is comparing AI roles and non-AI roles across industries. It is particularly pronounced for industries where you might not have expected these premium to be relatively high in the first place. And that is, for example, sales and marketing, the very first category here on the top, where if you compare the advertisement in sales and marketing with AI roles, AI skills being required and not AI and no AI skills being required for the same industry, we see a sizable premium in this case of actually 23%. But coming back to education, so what's about education and skills now? Is it really true that skills have become more important than education, particularly when it becomes when it comes to monetary reward? What we see in this chart are again our three categories that should be familiar to you now, though in a different order. We see the other, the average labor market on the very left hand side. And here we see what economists call an educational gradient. So the annual median salary is rising with the level of educational requirements. So far, so good. So what this tells us is that people with a bachelor's degree where a bachelor's degree is required can earn more money than, than those with no um, university education being required, and even more with a master's and even more with a PhD. We see that this picture somehow shifts for green roles, but the gradient is at least disregarding the long end, so the master's and PhD is still visible here. But we see that this kind of premium, that this gradient has entirely disappeared 
for AI roles when we look at positions where AI skills are required. And you might think now, okay, this has something to do with different sectors. So maybe these AI roles are just in specific industries or just specific regions. Maybe they're all clustered in London. And that's why these findings are slightly distorted from what you usually would be expect. We ran a regression analysis on this model in addition and showing you the same thing. Though in this case, we're actually controlling for a lot of factors. So we're controlling for the industry, the year, the sector, and also the region of this country. What we see on the left-hand side, again, on the average labor market, we see a beautiful educational gradient on wage premium. So people earn more with a bachelor's, with a master's, with a PhD, everything as it's supposed to be compared to no higher education requirement. We kind of see that this picture gets a bit blurry, but to some extent still existed for green roles. But, and that's the big message of this research, the educational premium, the additional educational premium, when you regard AI skills, has completely disappeared. And this is one of the strong indications, at least we believe in our work, that skills start to matter more than education, probably when it comes to the reward on the labor market, at least in our sample in the UK over the last um, four years. So these are our findings, again, summarized from our work. Um, have a look at our working paper which is currently under review with the Journal of um, Labor Economics. Um, you can also find this under the bit.ly link that I'm showing you here. And um, just to give a bit of advertisement for everybody interested in our work and also the students who might be interested in writing a, a thesis project on the topic of skills and working with new sources of labor market data. This is our skill scale project. You find more information on the skillscale.org or scan the QR code here. And I'd love to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Fabian, for, as all the others, a truly delightful and very insightful, uh, insightful job. Um, if I look around, you might pose questions in the chat. And if I ask you to do that, that is probably the most things that you will open my um, uh, chat possibility just for it in. One question um, immediately comes along, Fabian, if I go to the very last uh, presentation, the question is if this, in your words, distorted picture of the educational premium uh, is just a matter of time. Uh, I think right now, and it reminds me of early days of the IT industry, it's not everybody who can walk will find work, but everybody who can code, even to the slightest, and can spell Python or similar things uh, is immediately a hot quantity. We see it in um, our student assistants, who of course report that in a town like Munich, they will be, or in a town like Oxford, London, or wherever, are fetched away if they mention the word um, of one skill. And that is, do you did can you control for time of the development over time in your data already? That might be interesting because if you look in the green job market, you said it's it's kind of there, but the standard deviation seems to be very high, so it's still sorting it out. Um, and it could well be that it takes time for the educational programs to really come to the grips where the value add of the various degrees can be positioned so nicely that you get, as in your own words, the nice expected educational premium that you would expect. Yeah, thank thanks so much, Helmut, for, for condensing this question. Yeah, that's a really good point. So I would not say that we will observe this phenomena, skills winning over education, to put it very um, shortly, for a very long period of time. There will be educational adjustments, um, such as there have been in previous technological waves. I mean, if you go very, way back to the times of the rubber barons in the United States, there was uncharted territory. Everybody who could dig a hole was on board, regardless of where they came from, what they did. And we've seen this again and again and again with the emergence of computers, with the emergence of, of data science, for example. Education will adjust, and it will also adjust for artificial intelligence, probably. And the, the, this picture will return to the normal state, as economists would expect it. But what about the next wave of technological change? In that sense, um, it will smoothen out, but I think it will reoccur again and again and again. We will be, maybe in 10 or 20 years, have a similar discussion when it comes to new technologies around quantum computing, maybe, or something like that. So I think this is um, itself will smoothen out, but the you know, this chasing between skills and, and education will probably continue with every new technological wave of change. Thanks a lot for that. There have been um, a, a question to you, um, whether you expect this finding to be also found in other major economies, let's say continental Europe, US, Asian countries. 
Um, we know that this is the case for um, the United States. So there has been research on this in the United States. Though, of course, you have to take in consideration that, um, that there are specific characteristics in each um, regime or each each country in terms of how um, quickly the educational system adjusts. In, in, in Germany, for example, it's relatively strongly formalized. So therefore, it ensures high quality, but it also, ideally, but it also takes more time to adjust. And um, one of the <laughs> practical reasons, maybe for students, um, it, why we're not, why it's not so easy to investigate this in continental Europe, is because they don't like to talk about money that much. And you think, like, why does what what is that about? Well, be reminded this: when we're looking at um, online job advertisements, and what we need to have, the information that we need to have to to calculate this premia is the proposed wage. And if only ten percent of the vacancies in Germany, for example, speak about wages, it's much more difficult to run an analysis like this than, for example, in the UK or or in the United States, where 40, 50, if not 60% of all job advertisements contain wage information. I think you identify a long, large discrepancy in the educational sector. And if I start with um, discrepancy, I would like to go to Lulu. And one of the questions is um, the various apps you have studied, oh, that's a question by Ralph, um, how costly have they been? Were they free? Or uh, if I add to the questions, uh, did you have any idea whether they would look at specific skills or whether they would provide a wider array of insight in the educational content? Um, so about the costliness of the apps, I believe in that version that we uh, that I've showed today, um, these are the free apps from um, Apple Store. Um, but in this new index that um, I can show hopefully next time, um, we're using apps that are also uh, the, the, the paid one as well. So it will be a combined um, kind of just all apps. Um, and in terms of skills, what, what they deliver. So in the, uh, what we did is we just selected um, the education category in the app source, and that provides you with thousands of apps. And um, some of them are not really relevant for our question. So some of them were, for example, apps that you can play, um, play and learn, but for example, identify the stars, identify the rocks, these are not the apps that we are currently interested in. So what we are looking at is more narrowly focused on education. So for learning skills, but then also, for example, um, I mentioned um, virtual learning environments like Google Classroom and so yeah. on. So these were the apps that we included. Thanks a lot. If I look in the interest of time, I'd like to direct the last question to Stefan Kosher, looking at this timing discrepancy. Um, I do know that the courses that you actually run at uh, TU Munich are relatively large. They're horrendously large. Um, do you always use the same technology or do you have the same issue of skill and education speed gains um, in your environment? Um, because if you change the technology that you actually teach, you also have to have tutors that you have skilled up in the new area. So do you look for education or skills in hiring your tutors? We actually do interviews with them and we look for skills and uh, good education. So I would say both. Um, I think it's it's quite important that they have soft skills that they can communicate, but they also need to understand the topics very well that we ta teach. Otherwise, they can't really be of, of any help. And, you know, um, in, I, I get a lot of questions if we would like to replace those tutors. And I always say no, uh, because I think they are tremendously important in, in the interaction with students but we would like to free up some time for them so that they can go into the interaction with these students and that they don't have to answer um, a lot of questions um, again and again and again, and even the silly ones. Um, of course, we tell our students there are no silly questions, but uh, in fact, if you get the same question 100 times, then at some point you don't want to answer them anymore. It's and less than 10% that... of the population that asked the question. There's one question that you could finish up in copyrighted data privacy issues um, when work, if working with large language models. Yeah, definitely. Um, but we ask for consent. So uh, everyone who wants to use this feature on the platform has to give his or her consent. And in the future, we envision to use open source LLMs that we can host in the university data center. And then we can at least promise the students that and uh, the instructors that the data is kept privately. With that assuring note, I would like to close uh, today's session. I, I thank you for your attention. I thank especially the presenters 
for the lucidness of the arguments, very interesting to understand and highlighting very important issues. I also would like to thank the teams um, of the Oxford Internet Institute. Lucy, thank you. And uh, Tom Campos Albron, Bettina and Leonard, thank you for preparing the whole session. I would like to thank you for all for coming, at least for listening and viewing what's up. And I hope to see you again in the next session. The series will be continued. So see you next time. Thanks a lot.